Hi, I'm Kendra Abbott. I'm an ecologist uh, at the University of Alabama in the biology department. I'm a researcher. And I'm John Abbott. I am chief curator and director of museum research and collections for the University of Alabama. And today we just thought we would talk to you about our new book that's coming out, The Common Insects of Texas and the Surrounding States, and just what the method to our madness was in making some of the decisions and how we laid out the book. book, which you've probably seen, I've posted it on Facebook several times, but I'll stick it in here so you can see it. Um, it's a checkered beetle, which uh, I think looks a little bit like a reindeer. <laughs> it's like it's got, the reindeer of the insect world. It's got pectinate and tinny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Very colorful. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's a cool beetle found in Texas. Um, and so we threw that on the cover. Hopefully it's uh, eye popping and people want to grab the book off the shelf. Um, so the book contains about 1,300 uh, species and about 3,000 photographs. So it's really richly uh, illustrated. So it is published by um, the University of Texas Press, uh, but it is not part of their Texas Natural History Guide series that John has uh, two other books in. Um, so it is actually, uh, the decision was made to make it a little bigger so that we could make the images bigger for people to see the various character characteristics to identify the species. Yeah, the book will be five and a half inches by eight and a half inches, so still very much field guide size, uh, but uh, a little bit bigger, as Kendra said, than the, the Texas Natural History Guide series uh, volumes that uh, UT Press has as well. Yeah, so basically we... Um, we kind of toyed with how many species per page and uh, we threw it to the press. We could do eight or 12 species per page. Uh, we could easily fit those in. And if we had 12 species, I guess <coughs> per spread, I should say. And if we had 12 species per spread, then um, we would have less text, less information about them, just the characters to identify the species. And if we had uh, eight, we were able to put a little bit more information about their natural history, like what plants they're associated with or habitat, their habitat that they're associated with. And so we let the press decide and they came back uh, and said, let's do eight because in general they find that people really like when there's plants associated with the insects. So if you don't like that decision, it's not our fault. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy with it though. I think that, um, a lot of the plates really look nice yeah. um, and, and, and having fewer species but more variations of those yeah. species uh, works and I think having that additional text uh, also works so yeah. I'm, I'm very happy with we, that decision. We often have you know three four different color variations of the same insect. Yeah. So if you've seen the um, University of Texas Press they have a you know, the fall winter books that are coming out and there's a little call out in here that will give you a sneak peek inside. And the book will be out in September or October. We thought it was September, but we just noticed on Amazon that it says October. So, um, you may be able to get it a little sooner through UT Press directly. Yeah, you can pre-order it on Amazon right now, though. So, But we will let you know when we get our hands on a copy. And we are referencing a digital copy over here on the left. That's why we keep, we'll keep looking over here. So um, the book is organized by orders. And um, we tried to group them so that it was you could more easily see the tabs on the side. Yeah, I really, uh, we, we took some elements from my Dragonfly and Damselflies of Texas books, including the color coding. Um, I, I like that as a user of, of these types of guides. So we uh, came up with 11 different um, color codes, basically, or groupings uh, that are color coded uh, for this particular book. So we have a, an introductory uh, section uh, before getting into the species accounts. Uh, this contains a lot of uh, information that you would expect, but some things that, that aren't readily available elsewhere. So one of the things we included in this section is a table on the diversity of insects in Texas. We think there are around 30,000, uh, or we estimate there are around 30,000 species of, of insects in Texas. 
probably more than in any other state, uh, given Texas's size, its geographic location, yeah, areas. You can, you can compare your favorite insect group to see if Texas really is the biggest and the best <laughs> compared it, to the other state, other to North America and the world. That's right. Yeah, and then we just have some different, um, you know, just different introductory uh, insect information, like natural history, so development, the different types of development that insects go through, and um, information collecting. on collecting and uh, photographing and curating. And then one thing that's very important to Kendra and I is conservation. Um, we're both strong advocates of conservation. So we included a, a section on uh, endangered arthropods in Texas. Um, there are a number of them, especially associated with caves. And so there's some information and, and photographs uh, on some of those. And then as far as the layout yeah. of the pages goes, we tried to really make a conscious effort to uh, try and target both the amateur and the professional entomologists. So we have um, the si we tried to do more of the scientific names on the left and the common names on the right. So like on the top of the book, it will have Orthoptera for and then grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids on the right, so that you can easily, um, you know, find the group depending on you know where you are in your terminology. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, so for each spread, we included a, um, a range. Uh, this is not an exact range, uh, but rather an approximation based on regions in the state. So Panhandle, uh, you know, East, Central, West, Lower Rio Grande Valley, that kind of thing. Uh, and um, that's just because a lot of times the exact range of a species is, is just not known. So we also included uh, a seasonal phenology. Um, again, not exact like early and late dates. That's changing constantly and not known for you know most of these species, honestly. Uh, but uh, you know, is it a species you would expect to see in the spring, only in the fall, all year long, that kind of thing? So a little quick uh, seasonal uh, histogram is present, and then the um, species account itself gives you some characters that uh, to help you figure out or confirm that that's what you've got, uh, as well as some life history and uh, natural history uh, information about them. And then we did, if there was a character, like uh, for instance, the forktail bush Katie did has this Y-shaped um, super anal plate, and most people aren't gonna know what that is. So we do have a call out box where we zoom in on that character so you can see um, what we're talking about uh, for that character to get to that species. And the photos are largely not in situ. There are some in situ photos um, like at the beginning of each chapter uh, and, and scattered throughout, but by and large, the images are actually um, removed from their background or the subjects are removed from their background. Um, that is something that, uh, you know, the Kaufman Guide to North American Insects by Eric Eaton and Ken Kaufman does that. Uh, I think that it, it, that's very useful. I like the appearance of that. So we wanted to follow that. Um, but one thing that we really consciously tried to do is most of the time, books that do that remove the subject via post-processing techniques from the background. And that doesn't always make for the best uh, looking uh, image, uh, to be perfectly honest. And it's not as easy to highlight a character that might be useful for identifying the species. So if you can really light the subject up really well um, in a white box, then you can more easily um, be able to see the characters you want to see. Yeah, so we took the strategy of trying to photograph as many of these uh, species as possible in a controlled studio situation um, where we were photographing them on white to begin with. Uh, it really, you can control your lighting, you get a lot more detail as Kendra says, and I think that shows and I hope that that, uh, that, that will be obvious to, to people. We also tried to really maximize um, the size of the images uh, on these plates as yeah. well reducing the amount of white space. One of the things that I hate uh, about, you know, various field guides at times is, is when space is wasted, whether, you know, if it's an in-situ photograph and 
the subject is in the middle and or wherever, but there's a whole bunch of, of you know background included with it. Why not crop in on that? Uh, for the images that are on white, um, you know, we really worked hard to um, maximize the size of those on the plates, but with, you know, not making them so um, busy, busy uh, you know, trying to find yeah. that happy medium. But you will see, mm. you know, antennae overlapping and maybe some legs overlapping. And if we have the different variations of, of a species, like the different color variations of a species, we'll also have those maybe like overlapping like three on top of one another so you can just easily see and compare that those, how different they can be. Yeah, see the variation but not taking up space to duplicate yeah. uh, every little thing with it. Um, so I, I think, uh, we, we hope uh, that users will find it visually um, pleasing and, and yeah. impactful. That's, that was certainly part of our goal. And then each order was organized. So when you get to an order chapter, uh, it, on the left, there'll be an in situ image of that group and then just some natural history about the, about the order. And then on the right, we have various characteristics that are used to identify the species. We tried to, um, you know, make a book that's um, got new and novel information compared to, to you know, other resources that are either out there or have been out there in the past. So, uh, you know, some examples include like um, the Sokodia. Uh, I don't think any field guide, uh, these are the bark lice um, and book lice. I don't think any field guide, um, you know, goes into the amount of detail that we do with these. Um, they're we, a very common group of insects. And we kind of fell in love with them while we were doing this. Absolutely, too. yeah. Uh, a friend of ours uh, would actually send us uh, specimens. Oh, cat help. Shout out to Diane Young. Thank yes, you. She, uh, she would send us uh, specimens in the mail, and then uh, we would photograph them in the white box. Um, wing venation is very important, especially getting to the species level. And so that I found very challenging because, you know, you there were three different publications on wing venation and none of them had all of the characters in them. So there was a lot of merging of different um, papers to try and get an entire wing venation. Uh, we also, you know, another um, chapter, I guess it stands out in my mind in kind of a similar way is are the walking sticks. Uh, and we um, found, you know, Texas has uh, more walking sticks than any other state. Uh, a lot of diversity there. Diaphera mera is a common genus, and some of those can be quite tricky to separate. So we wanted to try to provide, the, you know, a good resource for doing that. So one of the chapters that we actually struggled with quite a bit um, was the fleas, and which seems uh, kind of crazy to have a hard time getting your hands on a cat or dog flea, but. All of our animals are on flea control. If they come to a vet or humane society, they will instantly give them uh, medication to kill the, any paras uh, external parasites that they have. And so by the time you would get there, they, the fleas would be dead or drugged enough where they didn't look good to photograph. So we finally tracked down a place that breeds them for research purposes, I'm sure, to study things like frontline and revolution. Uh, and we were um, looking at the, they're incredibly expensive to purchase some of them. But once uh, John told them what we were using them for, they're like, oh, we'll just send you some. So then we had a giant jar of fleas in our house. <laughs> we had, uh, uh, you know, they sent us 500 uh Flea, adult fleas uh, and uh, larvae, eggs, pupae. So it worked out really well. Um, and, but and we were very appreciative of that. And then, of course, the next day, or not, not really, but within a week or so, probably um, uh, we had strays at our house. We had a stray cat that had <laughs> fleas. So it's that classic story of when you're trying to find something, you can't find it, and when you don't need it, they're everywhere, kind yeah. of thing. But a huge shout out to folks that actually um, read each one of our chapters after we finished it. We had experts look at each um, each chapter when it was done to make sure that we um, 
we hit the species we should have hit and that we didn't have any errors in our chapters and stuff like that. Yeah, I, we reached out to um, colleagues that you know are experts on these groups and, and again, very appreciative of their uh, help in, in uh, catching errors and tightening things up and um, hopefully that uh, all will come across. Certainly it makes it a better book, I think. One of my favorite spreads is definitely the the one that we have in the call out that talks about what the book does with the pink Katie dids in it and the, the Jerusalem cricket and then the red eyed devil that's often found in Texas. That was probably one of my first giant insects that I encountered when I moved to Texas. So it's, it holds a special place in my heart and that it bit me. <laughs> <laughs> and bear, it hurt a lot. <laughs> you, you bear the scars. <laughs> yeah. I think for uh, I like the Neuroptera chapter. That's one of my favorites. I think just visually. You know, we included tried to include again information that wasn't readily available in other um, you know field guides. So we, for example, tried to photograph um, a lot of the different common um, mantid oothecids or egg cases because you can recognize species with those. So you'll find those in there. And we also, um, with wing venation, we would photograph the wing, but it's not always obvious. One, it, it's hard to see the venation sometimes, and it's not always obvious what is the venation. And so what we did is then we would go back through and trace the venation of the wings. Um, so things like cockroaches, you know, they fold their wings up, and sometimes you wonder, is that a vein or is it a fold? So. Um, you can hopefully uh, much more easily tell where the venation is and how to identify those species with, with some of our wing venation. Yeah, Kendra developed a, a technique of basically uh, illustrating the veins over the original image in Photoshop. It really uh, worked out well, I, I think. Yeah. And then we yeah. do have quite a number of uh, non-insect arthropods at the end of the book. Um, hopefully you'll find that very helpful. And we have a chapter on, at the end, in addition to the glossary, we have a chapter on additional resources. Um, there are a lot of both in print and digital resources that are available for these different groups. So they're broken down uh, in the, by the same uh, 11 categories that we use throughout the book. You will find uh, those uh, categories with additional resources um, yeah. listed here. So if you, you know, there's 30,000 insects you can run into, and if one of yours is not the 1,300 that we, uh, that we had in our book, you can maybe get close to where your insect falls and then use one of these resources to identify it to species. So hopefully that will be helpful. So we hope you really enjoy the book when it comes out, The Common Insects of Texas and the Surrounding States. And um, yeah. Yeah, look for it on the University of Texas Press's uh, website or on Amazon uh, where you can pre-order it now. And thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.